morning. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yes, I, I was not going to acknowledge it, but many of you have already asked how I'm doing after last night's football game. <sighs> thank you. Thank you. One Christian in the room. Roll Tide. I, uh, if I had hair at the beginning of the game, I promised it would be gone by the second half. But it is good to be here, and uh, God has a word for us today. In fact, I want to ask you, when you, when you dive into the word, what is your go-to book? What is your favorite book in Scripture? Like if you knew in the, you know, the weeks to come, I, I only had one book out of all 66 that I could read. You know, is it John? Is it Psalms? Is it Revelation? Yeah, right? Okay, all right, hold that, because we're going to shout it out together. I'm going to do like a three, two, one, and I want you all to yell out that book that jumps in your head, because I'm wondering if we're on the same page here, because I, I think we got, I'm going to show you a book too, and it's the one we're going to study today, and maybe, just maybe, we're all on the exact same page, and we'll all have that same book. All right, so you got it in your head? Everybody with me? You know what book you're going to shout out? All right, let's it nice and loud. Don't hold back, all right? Three, two, one, oh. Leviticus. So, no? <laughs> Who had Leviticus for September 29th? Anyone on their bingo card? No, I bet you didn't. So if you didn't have your quiet time in Leviticus all week in preparation to this, you get a pass, because most of us don't dwell here. We look at it, we think it's got some cranky old man, it's got some law, it's got some weird stuff in there, but you know what? If it's weird, it's in the Bible for a reason. Seriously, do you know that? If it's weird, it's in there for a reason. Leviticus has a word for us today. I am so fired up, and uh, go ahead and take your time finding it. You can open your Bible, find it, or pull up your favorite Bible app. While you do that, let me welcome our online guests. Great to have you with us. If you're out of town or maybe you're under the weather, we're praying for you. Thank you for checking us out. And to our guest in the big room, a special welcome. It is great to have you. You make our services better. My name is Pastor Matt. I'm the lead pastor here and one of several on our preaching team that you will encounter at the Potter's Hand. I would love to meet you after church. I would love to hug you, answer any questions you have. So come up. If there's a crowd or I can't be gotten to, please go to our Welcome Center. We've got Pastor Colin back there. We've got Miss Priscilla in our Connections booth. And they have a gift for you. And they would be great. They would just love to, to get rid of those gifts so we don't have to keep taking them home and giving them to my kids. All right? So please go back there and say hello to them in our booth. All right. Did I give you enough time to find Leviticus? I was just stalling on that. All right. We're going to be here in Leviticus chapter 19. Follow along with me, and it says this. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness, you shall judge your neighbor. Ooh, that sounds kind of weird. You shall not go about as a talebearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. All right? He says this again. There's something, there's a reason why he says this. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor. What's going on here? And not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Right? He says it again. There's a reason. I am the Lord. He's, is this, as if he needed that punctuation. Like, I've said all these things. Just to remind you who's saying this. I am the Lord. And he says this twice, and it's kind of odd. It's this beautiful passage of Scripture, and I think we hear that last part, love your neighbor as yourself, and we always equate it to a New Testament thing, don't we? But it goes all the way back, guys, to the laws of Moses when God is speaking and giving this to the Israelites. So my question is, when you look around, you see people getting weirder and more mean and more vitriol online. It's election year, and people just get, like, super strange. What does it look like to love your neighbor in 2024? What does that look like to us today? If a non-believer were to come and say, hey, what does it mean to love your neighbor? Would you be able to describe it? And if you're like me, most of the time you hear the word love, you go back to the Greek words. We're good at that. Agape, godly love. Uh, phileo from Philos, right? Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It's that brotherly love. Uh, eros, it's that erotic love. The, the love of the woman. I don't know why I'm always French when I, when I think that. Uh, storge. There's all these other words that, that we're, we're kind of used to, and we've dug into them, you know, here, and you've grown up with them in VBS, and you may have heard them, but why do we never look at the Hebrew word for love? Because it is radically different. I dug into this this week, and I was looking at the, the Hebrew word, and it's actually a Hebrew word that says ahab, and it is such a wide, unusual mix of emotions crammed into this. See, first off, 
It's a powerful and emotional, intense, loyal love and, and faithfulness, almost like it's a love that comes from the mind. Like, I am determined to love you and be faithful to you. But at the same time, way over here, it inhabits this passionate love, almost like a marital love, almost like an eros, this, this affection coming from the heart. So it's this broad, all-encompassing term that he's saying, you shall ahab your neighbor as yourself. Then it goes on, and it talks about this is the same word used for God's tender mercies when he's dealing with Israel or his unbreakable love for you and, and, and his, his commitment to his people. But it's also way over here, this romantic human type of love and close ties of friendship. You know, what's up, buddy? How you doing? But it's also a familial love, like a father to his son, right? How you doing, buddy? Right? It's that kind of love. So what gives? Which one is it that he's talking to here? Shall you give your neighbor a noogies? Is it the love of the woman type of love? Is it the godly love? Guys, it's an all-encompassing love. It's this really unique word, and I'm just so fascinated by it. When we see this word, there is a lesson here. Whatever love is needed in that moment is what you are called to give. It is a very powerful word that says the lesson here, your love is not passive. It's not just some kind of skipping around thinking compassionate thoughts. <laughs> Don't you love it when you're you're online or you see somebody and like somebody's in need or they're hurting or they're recovering from surgery and like you can tell that these people are not believers. They don't really know the Lord. They certainly don't believe in prayer. So they, it just, they can't say, I'm praying for you. So they say, sending positive vibes, right? Happy thoughts. May a galactic wind blow your favor in your way. The universe smiles upon, right? And they mean well. But as a person of faith, we know that that is nothing compared to the power of prayer and saying, I love you in Jesus' name. And it's this powerful word that was chosen for a reason. It's not about thinking compassionate thoughts. It's not about positive vibes, LOL, giggle, air hug, I'm thinking about you. That's not the word for us today. It's more than just a feeling. We look at the devastation in western North Carolina. Tennessee, our brothers and sisters, so much. I think every time the sun comes up, the devastation's worse. Entire cities gone. Entire cities in almost siege with roads being washed out, not able to get to. See, the act of love wants to do something about that. We have one of our heroes already on the ground over there, Sarah's husband, James. You all know Sergeant James. Rescued, I think, the first night, 37? 37 people from the rooftops with his helicopter. It's amazing. That's active love. And I think this is, this is the first lesson from Leviticus. True love is active. And it requires action. It's not just sending happy thoughts. It's not just vibes. So let me ask that question right away out of the gate here. What about us? Do we love in action, in deed? Or is it mainly lip service? Because to a hob somebody is all-encompassing love meeting them where their need is. Not what I think it is, but what their need really is. See, this forces me to be selfless. It also causes me to be intentional with my love. So, in fact, one of the things we're going to do, if you want to help with the devastation in our, in our western part of the state, we have a link. It's going to be on our website. It's also on our social media. We're partnering with the NC Baptist, the, the men on mission. Incredible. There's three things you can do right away. First one, most important, pray. Pray that families are found. People are still missing. Pray that power is turned on, going on. 48, 72 hours without any power. You can donate, and you can serve. You can volunteer. Maybe you're semi-retired or you have some time off. You, want, you can go there. You don't have to wait for my blessing or my direction. You can click on that link, and you can contact them directly and set up a time to serve what is good for you, okay? Hurricane Helene, you can see the link. Pastor Jason is going to put that link on the website. It's on our social media. Love requires action, intentionality. It is so easy to focus on ourselves, is it not? It is so easy to pull back and just be like, well, you know, I've got my own issues. We do. We, we moved into a house last week. Well, guess what? We got a hole in our roof. <laughs> we didn't know that until that hurricane came. It took our whole weekend. I mean, it's crazy. God, we think we got it fixed. We won't know until the next big rain, right? But it would be so easy for me to pull back and say, well, I've got my own mess, right? I can't do that. There's people a whole lot worse off. See, love requires action and intentionality. Let's do an experiment here, just so that we realize just how we are so focused on ourselves. 
I want you to think about the last time you were in a group picture. <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. Maybe you're out with a bunch of friends, ladies' night, and you get your selfie. Guys do this too, so <clears throat> man's night, we got a selfie, got our bro hugs, and we all do it. When you turn and look at it, who's the first person you look for in that photo? Absolutely, it's yourself. You don't go, I wonder if Milo's hair looked good. I <laughs> know <laughs> no, I'm not asking if my hair looked good. I just, but you're looking for yourself first. It's what we do. If you don't believe me, think about the time that you actually take a selfie or a buddy there, and the, <laughs> the first question is, hey, can I share this? You go, whoa, 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 whoa. Let me see it, <laughs> right? Let, let me see it first. Is it a good pick? Is it one of those, do I have seven chins? Or is it that one that has the most bizarre, unflattering angle that they want to share that picture where you look like a gnome from Harry Potter? Why is that? Because by nature, we are prone to evaluate ourselves and look inward first. But that's not godly love. We're called to a higher standard. We're called to look outward, to love others, to serve. It's not just a slogan on our wall, not just nice little cliche. Love God and love people. Serve God and serve people. We love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So the question is, well, who's our neighbor? It's a question that gets asked a lot. In fact, it's, it was asked of Jesus. This is such a famous interaction because Jesus was asked a question that many people ask still today. If you haven't heard this story, it's in Luke 10. We won't dive into that. I did a whole sermon just on that part. But it's a famous scene where a lawyer comes up to Jesus, and he does lawyer speak, and I love it. He comes up to him, and he says, a teacher, oh, which is the greatest commandment of them all? And everybody, I can imagine, gets quiet, and they look, and they look over at Jesus. How's he going to answer? And I love what Jesus does. He answers the question with another question. He says, well, you've read the law. What do you think? And everybody just turns and looks like a, like a tennis match, right? They look over, and he says, <clears throat> well, the law says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, <sighs> and love your neighbor as yourself, that part too. And everybody looks over back at Jesus. <laughs> What's he going to say? He says, oh. You've answered right. Go and do that, and you'll live. And you think it's over. And if that lawyer was smart, it would have been over. But he pushes it one more, and I, I just cannot help it. Every time I read this story, I picture the actor Eric Avari. Anybody know of Eric? If you have, here, here's a photo of him. I always picture this guy coming up to Jesus with his pipe, and he clears his throat. What's he trying Oh, which is the greatest of the laws? What's it, what's it really about? Right? And if, you, if you're having trouble thinking of him as a spiritual guy in Mr. Deeds here, here he is in, in The Chosen. Maybe he's a little more spiritual for you. And he asks this question, and I bet immediately he wishes he hadn't because Jesus just lays it out. Here's his response. Starting in verse 30, look with me. He says, so Jesus answered with a story. He says, a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him up, and they left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. Oh, a temple assistant came up. Okay, good. Well, here's the, maybe this person will help. Walked over, looked at him lying there, and he also passed by on the other side of the road. Then a despised Samaritan. Ooh came along, right? He, they're just the worst in their eyes. And when he saw the man, he also ran to the other side of the street and did nothing to help. No. He had compassion for him. When Jesus said that, I guarantee you that lawyer was uncomfortable. Well, he did what now? Not only that, going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil Put wine and bandits them? Like, that's, that's expensive stuff. And then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and when he got there, he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins saying, take care of this man. I'll tell you what, if the bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. And he looks at the lawyer with all his lawyer speak, and he cuts right through it. He says, now you tell me, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to this man who was attacked by bandits? Oh, and I could just feel the reluctance in his voice. I suppose the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yeah. Now go and do the same. Guys, there's so much good going. 
do not miss the context of this. Don't read this with American eyes. Don't read this in 2024. Know what's happening here. I cannot overstate the disdain, no, the hatred these two groups had for each other. These two people would never associate, much less, this is a hated for The priest didn't do anything? The lay minister didn't do anything? But a hated, known foreigner, a Samaritan? Are you kidding? They're the worst. That's worse than an Auburn fan listening to Nickelback eating a tofu burger. It is literally unthinkable. Yeah, that's bad. Maybe even a Georgia fan. And they come up, and when he mentions this, I promise, guys, everybody's saying, well, well Jesus, that's not, we don't even recognize them. They look at us as half-breeds, and we feel the same. We don't talk to each other. We don't, we're not going to go up and acknowledge him. Let's just bandage him. And put him on a horse and take him to a hotel and do all this stuff. And Jesus is going, yeah, you are, if you want to be one of mine. Because this is what we're called to do. This is radical love. And I think Jesus is probably making a point here that those religious people, they were just loving in, in words. That was a Levite. This is, I mean, the Levites and the, the priests, they, they would have done the right thing in everybody's eyes. But the fact they didn't show that their intentions are meaningless when they're not backed up. See, we're supposed to express love to people when they need it most, but they didn't. First John addresses this. First John 4 says, if someone says, hey, I love God, but they hate their fellow believer, that person is a liar. There is no truth in him. You are a liar. If he hates his fellow believer, that person is not speaking the truth. He doesn't know God. And this is hitting so strongly in this crowd that Jesus is talking to. And I think what happens is these good people, they mean well, but they fall into the trap that we do. And you know what that is? That's judging the man for the condition they find him in. Thinking, you know what, maybe he's just a drunk. Maybe he's foolish with his money. You know what, I, I don't mean to sound prejudiced. Maybe he's just reaping what he sows. Maybe he deserves, maybe he's just getting what he deserves. If he made bad choices, I mean, isn't that on him? And there is the mistake. We don't know the motives. We're not God. God didn't say love these people if they meet all of our list. He said, love these people. You are my hands. You are my feet. And I need you to meet them in their brokenness. And I think that's his next point. He's saying, you need to look past the brokenness and love them right where they are. Can I just be honest here? When we look and we judge them for their brokenness, you know what it does? It kind of gives us a pass for helping them because we come up with a motive that justifies our inaction, right? Get a job, dude. What are you doing? You know, we don't know that something horrible happened. We don't know he has a medical condition or he lost his whole family in a tidal wave or a mudslide last weekend. We don't know any of that. And Jesus says it's irrelevant in this case. Look past their brokenness and love them. When we judge others in their brokenness, it distracts us from the ability to show the love of Jesus. In Romans 13, Paul actually elaborates on this, that, on this thought, right? Look at what he says. He says, owe nothing to anyone, oh, except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. For the commandments say you must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal, you must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to others, so love fulfills the requirements of God's law. All right, now check this out in another translation. This is so good. Don't run up debts except for the huge debt of love you owe each other. When you love others, you complete what the law has been after all along. The law code. Don't sleep with another person's spouse. Don't take someone's life. Don't take what isn't yours. Don't always be wanting what you don't have. And any other don't you can think of. It finally adds up to this. Love other people as well as you love yourself. You can't go wrong when you love others. And when you add up everything in the law code, the sum total is love. You know, we look at that, we think, yeah, you know what, that's right, that's good. Can we just go and get the lowest trace and beat everybody else to the food? Can we just go? No. Because that's where most modern-day Christians stop reading. But he doesn't stop writing. Paul goes on. He says something that's so strange. He shifts gears. He totally does like this bizarre. It's almost like I feel like a holy huddle. Like Paul says, all right, so I've said the stuff you know you should be doing. you got to love others. But now, come here. And I want to come in. And he has this bizarre shift of, of 
urgency, almost like he's whispering a secret. He goes on, he says this, read it with me. He says, this is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. The time's running out, gang. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. That's how fast it's coming. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dirty deeds, done dirt cheap like dirty clothes, and put on shining armor of right living. I love that last line. Put on the shining armor of right living. Did you catch his urgency? Did you catch this? I love that. Paul is using a word here, put on, for the armor of light. He is using a Greek word that we don't see much. It's in duo. And in the strong, you know I'm going hardcore when I get out my strong's exhaustive concordance that weighs 37 pounds. And I did a little research in this. This word in duo means to put on, to be clothed with, to be clothed in, to, to have on, almost like you are sinking into your favorite bathrobe. And you've put it on, and you've cinched it up, and you go, ah. Have you ever done this for your kids? They're cold, they won't get out of bed, so you go to the dryer, and you put their clothes in the dryer, and you heat them up, put them on. I hate that, because I'm sweating, right? <laughs> but everybody else loves that. And you sink into it. I just look at their face, and it's so luxurious, and I can just imagine how awesome that feels for normal people. <laughs> to in duo, to, to put this on, to sink into it. Then he goes on and he uses the same word in verse 14. He says, I want you to enduo the Lord Jesus, to put on the Lord Jesus himself. Stop and think about your actions just in the last few days. Would you describe them as putting on the Lord Jesus himself? That's the standard. That's the goal. See, this is my job, just to point it out. Don't hate the messenger. <laughs> right? Then, if that's not enough, he uses the same word again. This is a rare word. He uses it in Ephesians 4.24, and he says, and put on your new self. For the old deeds are gone. Put on your new self, the likeness of God. You created in righteousness, holiness, and truth. Would you say your life exhibits righteousness, holiness, and truth? Man, oh, to have people look at us and assume we are people of faith because we exude righteousness, truth, love like that, holiness. And just like that law expert, a lot of people today say, all right, listen, I get this. Who exactly is our neighbor? I mean, it's so overwhelming. We look around, and I see so many problems today, and I mean, is it a scam? Is it... By the way, by the way, I want to address this from the pulpit. I hope we're streaming here. Everybody hear this. We will never, never, I will never, your staff will never send out an email or a text asking you for money, or to meet with us in private, or we have a confidential matter to discuss with you, do not send money to whoever does that. I know just this week, Pastor Bill and his wife had a, a cloned account, and they were sending out stuff in there. That is not them. We will never do that. You've probably had your accounts cloned. It's not hack, it's cloned, it's out there. And often, you don't even know what's happening. Hopefully our characters say, that is not us. That's not you. That is a scam. Don't send money. Don't if we ever have a need, you'll hear from it face to face. We'll come and go, hey man, can I borrow your ladder? Like, right? It's like a legitimate need, okay? And you can, you can kind of, a lot of, and it's worded really well at the beginning. So look for that. You'll, you'll be like, oh, bless their heart. Pastor Matt needs a little something. And you know, he wants to meet with me alone. No, no, no. He does not want to meet with you alone. Never. He does not want your money. Pastor Bill doesn't. Pastor Jason, that's, that is a scam, okay? Hit reply and watch that email address quickly go from Pastor Matt to xr 747 indonesiacom or something like that, okay? Just know that, all right? Be defending each other's honor and, and character. Pastor Bill would never solicit funds like that, and we would never ask to be alone. And if you read, it gets a little creepy. It always talks about confidentiality and things like that. Just say, just don't fall for that. We see these things, and, we, and, we, uh, and our, our instinct is to pull back and say, you know what, I'm not going to help anybody. I'm not going to help anybody because it's just too much and it's overwhelming. I, I didn't think about this. My wife got one this week. She came up to me. She goes, I didn't know you were having a hard time. Here you go, pal. I'll help you out. I'm like, what are you talking about? She said, I just got your email. I said, are you kidding me? I email my own wife and say, could you have $20? <laughs> yeah, a little help here. So with the legitimate needs out there, church, what do we do? 
How do we possibly make a difference? If you've ever felt that way, relax. You're in good company. And thankfully, Jesus, as he always does, removes the worry. He cuts through the confusion, and he makes it crystal clear. Our neighbor is the one right in front of us. Our neighbor's the one you see right here that you're dealing with. Don't worry about over there right now, okay? If you can't even minister to Jerusalem, right? Don't think about Judea and the other most parts of the world. Have you ministered to the one that God has sent your way today? Have you ministered to this one? Have you shown love to them? Our neighbor is simply the one right in front of it. Don't complicate this and then use that as a cop-out. Well, I just don't know what to do with any of it, so I'm going to do nothing. See, we're paralyzed by our fear and our cynicism. When I stopped and I helped that guy who had his truck hood popped up, and I said, oh, I can't believe you're going to give him money. And the next day I drive by, and he's still running out of gas, the same spot. And I'm like, i got to give us more money. And my wife's like, honey, <laughs> this is a scam. I'm like, what? People don't do this. Yeah, they do. And it was real easy to say, well, I'm not going to help anybody. See what I just did? I let one bad apple ruin me giving legitimately in the name of the Lord. Because my cynicism took me there. And it was justifiable, right? Who wouldn't? That's normal. Good for you. You're just showing godly wisdom, Pastor. Take that $20 and go to Bojangles. What'd I do? I just consumed it on myself. Our neighbor is the one right in front. Do for that one what you wish you could do for everyone. Great quote. I think that was Andy Stanley that said that once. Do for the one what you wish you could do for everyone because it makes a difference there. All right, so let's get practical down to where we live. I want you to think about this. As you go through your day this coming week, I want you to be aware of what you're paying attention to, okay? This is going to take intentionality. You're going to have to pull back from staring at the road, getting in road haze. You're going to have to pull back from your phone. You're going to have to put it down. You're going to have to look around. And I want you to say, Lord, is there a neighbor in need right in front of me? Is there somebody I can meet a need right here? Is my path crossing? Is it the cashier? Is it the, you know, well, now it's self-checkout, right? So you got to do your, it's that creepy dude standing there at the end looking at your receipts. You know, maybe he needs something. Maybe it's uh, the server at your table. Milo and I were at Applebee's yesterday. And we struck up a great conversation. and We could see some needs. The table right behind us were four young kids going berserk. It was hard to even have a conversation. And then I watched the cook come out from back and go to that four young people, one of them in a high chair, and give them some more toys and coloring pages. Pat on the head, give them a hug, and then go back into the kitchen and cook my food. And I looked at Milo and I said, these are his kids. And then another server came, and when this kid got a little fussy, pulled the youngest one out of the high chair, set the little boy on the ground, and let him run around. And my heart melted, right? We were looking like, that is so cute. And then I watched another server come and pick him up and swing him around. And man, I almost got up, picked him up, and swung him around. They're like, who's this creepy guy? And I looked and I said, good for them. It would have been so easy to call out or say, I can't come, you know, whatever. But they're doing what they can, right? And there's needs everywhere. For us, our server, the cook. You know, when you go in, you pay for your gas, uh, the person at the next table, the drive through You know, see, we're so thinking about ourselves, we're so focused, and we're hurried to the next thing. I feel like we're like that, that priest with good intentions, but we're, I got to go. Pastor, don't you know, I got to get somewhere. We're so busy looking down. We're so busy on our phones. We're so busy. This is a challenge for all of us. Be on the lookout for how you can live out the command of Jesus. Anybody know the name Jim Cimbala? Pastor of Brooklyn Tabernacle? Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir? Mm -hmm. Incredible. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and have our instrumentalists come back up here. We're going we're gonna to land the plane here and have prayer. I've got his books right here. I think she's got a slide that shows, if you haven't read Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, and some of these, incredible. Great man, godly man, pastor of Brooklyn Tab, the famous Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. He posted this online recently, and it floored me. I cannot believe his humility to share what I'm about to share with you. Jim Cimbala was preaching. It was Easter Sunday. And he said this, he said, I was so tired at the end of the Sunday, I had multiple services, and I just went to the edge of the platform, and I sat down, I pulled my tie down, and I draped my feet over the edge and just kind of swung them. It was such an awesome day. 
What a wonderful service. So many people coming forward, the counselors were talking, I had my volunteers, getting people in the right places. And as I was sitting there, I made the mistake of looking down the middle aisle. And there, about three rows back, was a man who looked about 50, gross, filthy, disheveled. And then he looked up at me and we made eye contact. And he looked at me sheepishly as if to say, could I possibly talk to you? And he says, now guys, listen, we have homeless people all the time here in New York City, all the time. They always want to come in, they always ask for money. And so I sat there and I said to myself, though I'm ashamed, what a way to finish this Sunday. It was going so good. We were having such a good time. I preached my heart out. We're ministering. People are here. The altar's full. And here's this fellow, probably drunk, wanting more money for wine. And then he did it. He stood up and he walked to me at the front of the church. I'm sitting on the side trying to not notice. And then I smelled the most horrible smell I have never smelled a smell this bad in my life. The smell got to me before he did. It was so awful, I began to gag. When he got close, I literally had to inhale by looking away from him. And then I would turn my face to him, talk to him, and then I would look away and I would breathe again. That's how intense this smell was. So finally I looked at him and I said, hey, tell me your name. He said, my name is David. How long have you been on the street, David? Six years. How old are you? 32. 32. He looked 50. His hair was matted. His front teeth were missing. He stank. He was a stereotypical wino. Even his eyes were glazed over. David, where did you sleep last night? Down the road in that abandoned truck? You know, I keep money in my, my back pocket. Got some credit cards, some other things, and I reached back there, I fumbled around to pick out some money, thinking, all right, you know what, I'm just going to give them some money. We don't usually do this. We get a volunteer, or they're all busy, or, you know, maybe we'll take them to eat. But we try not to give out cash to people. But I went and I grabbed, I took the money out, and David thrust his finger in front of me and says, no, I don't want your money. I want this Jesus, the one you've been talking about. There is something here. And if you don't tell me about Jesus, I'm not going to make it. I'm going to die on the street. Pastor Jim said, I began to weep. In fact, if I'm being honest, I forgot completely about David because I started to weep for myself. Here I was, about to give this guy a couple dollars to someone that God had clearly sent to me. See how easy it is? See this? I could make the excuses. I had them. I was tired. I'd worked hard. I'd done the sermon. I preached my heart out, talked to thousands of people. But you know what? There is no excuse because I was not seeing this man the way God sees this man. And I was not feeling the way God feels. But boy, did that change. David just stood there. He didn't understand what was happening to me. I just sat there crying and weeping, and I pleaded with God right there in front of him, God, forgive me. Forgive me? Please forgive me. I am so sorry to represent you in this way. I am so sorry. Hear me. Here I am. I'm standing here with my message. I got all my points. Everything's going great. And you send somebody right in front of me, and I miss it. I'm not even ready for it. Oh, God, forgive me. Then something happened. Something came over David and me, and we began to weep together even more. And then David fell on my chest. I'm sitting there, his face against my white, beautiful, starched Easter shirt, my tie getting all our funk all over it. And then I put my arms around him, and we just wept together on each other. Then the smell of this person changed to a beautiful aroma. Here's what I felt the Lord said to me in that moment. If you don't love this smell, I can't use you. Because this is who I called you to minister to. This is what you are about. You are now about this smell. That morning, that changed Pastor Jim. But it also changed David. Check this out. Here's the happy ending. This homeless man started to memorize portions of scripture. It was incredible to see him come alive. We got him a place to live. We hired him on at the church to do our maintenance. We got him new teeth. He fixed his teeth. And my goodness, he was a handsome man. You wouldn't recognize him. When he came out of the hospital, he was detoxed in just six days. Then he spent Thanksgiving at my house with my family. And then he spent Christmas at my house with my family. We were there that Christmas morning exchanging presents. I'm not expecting anything, but he pulled out this little gift and he said to me, Pastor, this is for you. And I opened it up and it was just this little white handkerchief all he could afford. 
A year later, David got up in that same pulpit and talked about his conversion to Christ. And he said, the minute he took the mic, I knew in my heart, oh my goodness, he's going to be a preacher. That man that I almost rejected is going to be a preacher. And this past Easter, we ordained David. He is now the associate pastor at a church across the street, across the river in New Jersey. And I was this close to saying, hey, take this. I'm busy. See how easy it is? See how easy it is? It's a pastor. It's a good man. And I applaud his transparency. I've been there. How about you? Here's my challenge. Who's God putting in your path? I mean, you just look around, guys. The world needs a Savior. We're the hands and feet. <laughs> We're it. <laughs> for good, for bad. It's you, it's me, it's the bride of Christ. My challenge is for us this week to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Can we do that? Pray with me. Father, in these next few moments, would you speak to us? Would you open our hearts? Help us not to miss what you have for us. We love you. Holy Spirit, you are welcome to chisel anything off our heart that doesn't resemble you. In Jesus' name, amen.